very dear friend of mine had hepatitis C and he didn't have any money and he wound up being broke and losing his teeth and um, he committed suicide. I visit him and I have conversations with him. It's just a place that I go to think about how fortunate I am that I'm alive. This is where I used to live. When I was homeless on the street. It's where I used to hide, buried in the corner, huddled in the corner. It would pick up cardboard and basically make a wall here so no one would see us. Shooting up drugs is not something that's socially acceptable, you know? You always hear people say, oh, I only drink socially. Well, I like the joke, I only shoot up socially. I kind of had this attitude like I'm already, you know, my liver's already going to die. I'm already, you know, done for. I mean, kind of, I don't know, I felt like I had nothing to lose. I loaded up two needles with as much as I could fit, like a gram each. I injected both of them into my arm. I woke up alive, which wasn't my plan. young age, having no food in the house and having no clothes and utilities always getting shut off. I wasn't parented, basically. I mean, it made me a lot stronger, a lot more independent, but it also left me with a lot of, a lot of issues. I first used drugs at age 15. I started smoking weed and drinking. And then when I was 18, I started doing heroin. I'd have a year on, a year off like that for about 13 years. A couple years ago, I was at a good place in my life, actually. I wasn't using drugs anymore. I had a good job. And then that's when um, I started to feel uh, sick. That's when I started to feel the symptoms of the hep C. When someone has hepatitis C, it affects them psychologically. It's like this weight, this burden that I always carried. There's a loneliness that comes with it. You know, what girl would want to be with me after this? It can cause more issues and it can make existing issues, especially like drug addiction and depression it can make them a lot worse. I saw a couple doctors, they all pretty much said the same thing, which was, it's not killing you right now. And I was very shocked to encounter just apathy from them. I think my greatest fear is picking up again and never coming back. Tomorrow's a new day. I don't know what's going to bring tomorrow. My addiction started after the death of my mom. It was a really hard loss. I didn't know who I was supposed to perform for anymore because I was performing for my mom my whole life. I didn't know how to deal with it. I, I didn't want to deal with it. So I escaped by shooting up crystal meth. That's how I dealt with that pain and rotate parallel with the inner thigh, and then bend the knee up and the toes drag and open on the floor. Great, good, breathe. I felt like I wasn't worthy, like 
I could never attain happiness again. I felt like I was a piece of I was feeling really, really depressed, very lethargic, lost all interest in um, life. And I got tested by the doctor and he said, you have hepatitis C? And I was like, hepatitis C? I didn't even know anything about it. And they found out I had between stage two and three cirrhosis of the liver, which is pretty quick because I was just newly infected. But I guess when you're both HIV positive and have hep C, the progression is much greater and quicker than it would be for someone who's healthy. When I was 16, I ran away from home and lived on the streets. One night it was my birthday and it was pouring rain and I'm sleeping under a tree in the public garden, and I'm like, well, happy birthday. This is my life, you know? By the time I was 22, 23, things just weren't working for me anymore on the streets. I was looking at my life, and I'm like, well, you know, I'm a drunk, I'm a drug addict, I don't have any place to live, and I just realized something's gonna stop. I found my way into the recovery process. I started going into 12-step meetings. I get a letter in the mail from the health department, and I open the letter. The words were the, had the biggest impact because anything in writing is like, it's right there, you have hepatitis C. And I just was concerned that if this disease got out of control, or if I did something wrong, who was gonna take care of my mother? If hep C started to consume me, who was gonna take care of her? It was my responsibility to take care of my mother. I was her son. And um, when she died, um, I hadn't gotten my cure diagnosis yet. And I know she would've wanted to hear that. I've pretty much been on my own since I've been very young. I came from a very dysfunctional family. My parents were abusive to me, and they fought a lot. There were a lot of rough times. That's how I got involved with drugs originally. I swore I would never touch heroin. I mean, I was into smoking marijuana and the hallucinogenics and peyote and mescaline and LSD, of course but I never wanted to do heroin. I always knew that was a bad thing. As soon as I injected that heroin, it was the best and worst moment of my life because I felt good instantly, like that. But I also knew I was addicted at that moment. That's how I contracted the hepatitis C. And when my son was born was when I realized I had to stop. There was no way to keep going. I knew what my life was like with my parents, and I swore to myself to get off drugs. In 2015, I was feeling pretty bad. I had absolutely no energy. It would take me a half an hour to tie a shoe because I would fall asleep in the middle of tying the shoe. I didn't have the strength to shower. I was just waiting to die. But I wasn't gonna cry about it because I always felt I did this to myself. If somebody develops cancer, then it's really sad because they didn't ask for it. I asked for it. I got what I deserved. The last doctor I got, I knew when I walked in his office that it was gonna be different. He actually treated me with compassion and he showed a genuine desire to help me. So I had a lot of hope actually, I felt good about it. But then 
you know, months went by and, you know, and then a year and uh, they're still fighting to get the insurance company to approve the medication. That's when I kind of gave up. When I gave up hope on getting treatment, that's when everything got out of hand. And so I, I bought a ticket to Bangkok. And then when I got to Bangkok, I had no plan. I had no destination. I decided, you know, I had a good run. I lived a good life. I think it's time to check out. So I went down to the firing range and I got a, a nine millimeter pistol and I was just gonna blow my brains out. Something inside of me changed. There was this voice inside of me saying, well, this is not your path. And then I got the email from my doctor that the medication was approved. My doctor had actually purchased the medication. They held it for me um, at his office, even though I was abroad and I hadn't even checked in with him for like six months, but they had it there. They still were working on it, which is amazing. They were still, they were still fighting for it. I decided to come back. 90 days and I mean, as soon as I got back, I got a job again. It was like all of a sudden, all these good things started coming my way. I have a great relationship with my doctor. A lot of people don't have that. A lot of people struggle to find a doctor that respects them and that listens to them and looks at them. And it's really hard to make eye contact when you feel shame, because maybe you got it from injecting drugs. It's been the difference between life and death. To have people that are there when you need them. <laughs> After what my doctors did for me, I would feel guilty to screw that up, it made me want to have a better life. I see a lot of change in myself and who I am today. I have a job, I have a career. I'm a community outreach education manager. I educate people on viral hepatitis, hepatitis C, and liver disease. Point through the foot and flex the toe, the ball, the foot, the heel. My recovery needs to be three-pronged, mind, body, spirit. And if any one of those is lacking, I'm gonna be in trouble. That's what I've learned in my pattern. But I'm doing really well right now, so that's all I can do. All we have is today. Woke up today, I'm sober today, and that's all I can talk about is today. Now that I'm cleared and feeling better, I can actually seek out the goals that I always had. If I didn't do that 16 months ago, I, I probably wouldn't be, you know, sitting here right now, sober. We're all I think I've always been a humanitarian. I just never knew it. Do aid work and, you know, just help people. And I'm thinking about going to school, getting my nursing degree. Now that I learned to just let these good things come into my life, and I learned not to give up hope. I used to have hep C days. I'd wake up and I'd be like, ugh, feeling like cramps and muscles, nausea, headaches. I'd have all these side effects from the disease. And now I have hep free days where I wake up and I'm like, okay, what are we doing? <laughs> Happy birthday, dear Paul. Happy birthday to you. Jolly. Being cured of the hepatitis C has opened up a whole new world for me that I never thought would even be available to me. <laughs> you have your own. <laughs> wow. You like it? Yeah, I love it. It's as if it was made for me. I mean, at 65 years old, being madly in love with somebody that I'm going to start to make a life with and recording a new record is quite a shock for me, <laughs> to say the least. A 
Originally, a lot of the songs were written in a depressive state. Now I'm writing different type of material, like some love songs, dare I say, <laughs> which for me is unusual because my, my work is usually pretty dark. This is the first time in 40 years that I've been virus free. The fact that I'm well enough to perform again, to go out there and get in front of an audience, to feel that again was fantastic. For me, the treatment has saved my life. Leave a You know it's time to take a leap of faith. Thank you everybody. It's good to be back.